I sense a, a great darkness. Shit, Empire has returned. Psionic Ascension Rush is back and it is more powerful than ever. In this video, we're going to really give in to the dark side and push to make a whopping 600 alloys per month in the first 50 years of the game. I'm going to show off the build and then go through basically every click that you need to do to make this happen. Sit down with your drink and your snack and let me tell you why Psionic Ascension is now the best Ascension in the game. To showcase this, I'd like to introduce the Sith Empire are bringing Psionic Rush back and I gotta tell you, I am having a heart attack. Let's start with the basis of this build, the Psionic Rush, and of course that comes from our Teachers of the Shroud origin. Teachers of the Shroud blocked you from taking any Ascension path other than Psionic Ascension. But for us that will not matter because we really, really want to psionically ascend. We will start with the latent psionic trait on all of our pops. This basically means they get the intelligent trait for free at plus 10% physics society and engineering research and half of the traditional trait at plus 5% additional unity output. We can also build a shroud beacon right from the start of the game and very importantly we start in contact with a shroud walker enclave. On top of that we have the psionic theory technology as a guaranteed research option so we can research that at any time and once we complete it we can begin going down the psionic ascension path by taking the psionic tradition. The other traits we're going with are aquatic, that will give us extra ocean habitability so our capital of course is always at 100% but our two guaranteed habitable worlds will also be at 100% habitability because they will of course be ocean worlds. On top of that we'll reduce our housing usage by 10% on all of these ocean worlds and our workers produce 10% more food, energy and minerals. On any non-wet worlds we get minus 20% habitability and plus 30% housing usage. We're going to try and stay off non-wet worlds so that hopefully won't be an issue. To make sure that our leaders last long enough we're going to take the enduring trait so that they are still alive around year 50 without having to do too much gimmickry. Last up on the positive traits we have incubators. Incubators grants a phenomenal pop growth boost when a colony is first founded starting at plus 30% and as your colony increases in size that eventually moves over to being minus 10% pop growth speed when you get around uh, 38 or it's 45 pops, some large number. In terms of negatives I've gone for solitary because that is completely offset with the housing usage reduction on ocean worlds so actually solitary is a free pick and unruly which does increase our empire size from pops by 10% but we can hopefully work around that when it is important. Jumping over to ethics and civics, anglers is now very very good. We are starting on an ocean world and we do have aquatic as our main species that is necessitated by anglers it's also good for us, that's partly why we took it, we will get uncapped agriculture districts on our ocean worlds. On all wet worlds, farmers are replaced by anglers and pearl divers. Two farmers becomes one angler and one pearl diver. Anglers produce more food than a regular farmer and an additional two trade value, so they are uber farmers. Pearl divers is an interesting job that produces six consumer goods and two trade value and it requires quite a bit of food and a little bit of mineral upkeep. We're going to be using the pearl diver job so that we don't need as many artisans and we don't need to worry about specializing our planets as much. On top of that Minister of the Seas is very very tasty as well. That's going to grant us plus 0.3 food and plus 0.2 consumer goods from our anglers and our pearl divers. It's also a position that officials can take which will be important because we're going to be getting a level 5 official right at the start of the game. If you've seen my recent civics tier list you may know that parliamentary system is phenomenal. It's S tier. What does it do? Well factions will form shortly after the start of the game. That will be granting us, because we're going to make sure those factions are happy, at least plus 5% but sometimes plus 10% happiness empire wide. On top of that we'll get a whole bunch of extra unity production and if that wasn't enough parliamentary system also gives us an additional plus 40% faction unity gain. So we are going to get lots and lots of unity from our factions. We're going to take egalitarian because we will be making use of the fantastic utopian living standards especially early on. Utopian living standards is going to help us boost our science and boost our planetary stability. By taking spiritualist 
we're going to not just reduce our edict upkeep and edict cost, that's going to be helpful for running more edicts early in the game, but also we'll start with some temples, so a bit more unity production and a third industrial district. That third industrial district means we don't have to spend an extra year and a half building one, and we're going to get extra jobs right from the start for phenomenal initial production. Our initial production as the Sith Empire is going to be legendary. Last but not least, I'm running with Xenophobe. That's going to give us a bit more pop growth speed, and it is one of the easiest factions to make happy right at the start of the game. And as we're going to be spawning factions straight away, we want our factions to be happy. On top of that, because we're going for a Psionic Ascension rush, we don't really want to take Militarist because we don't want to risk getting Eater of Worlds. Eater of Worlds is honestly the worst of the four covenants. We're going to be looking at some other covenants when it comes time. When it comes to Vishia, the Emperor of the Sith Empire, I've gone for a commander and logistics understanding. It would also be very reasonable to take charisma early on, that can be quite a nice trait, or even possibly eye for talent, but I will try and make use of some reductions to my docked ship upkeep around year 25 and 30 when I finally put out quite a nice large fleet. Once more the Sith will rule the galaxy. And we shall have peace. These are the settings I'm going to use if you'd like to play along at home. We're the Sith, we're going to use the dark side, and we're going to try and get up to over 500 alloys per month in the first 50 years of the game. The first thing that happens as the Sith Empire is some Sith Acolytes give us 25 crystals. We're going to say yes, thank you, and move on. I'm going to change my Diplomatic Stance for Isolationist to boost my monthly unity and increase my Governing Ethics attraction. I want all of my pops to follow our Governing Ethics. I'm also going to move my economy from a mixed economy over to civilian. I'm going to want to pump out lots and lots of consumer goods early on so that by around year 15 or 20, I can switch over to a militarized economy and stay there for the rest of the game. Militarized economy does the opposite of civilian. That grants us a massive boost to alloys at plus 25% and reduces our consumer goods output by 25%. In terms of initial technology choices here, I've got some really good ones. I want to take hydroponics farming straight away. If you're playing on single player, you might actually want to reload the game if you don't get hydroponics farming straight out of the gate. Global energy management is nice for that extra capacity subsidies that will help us early on with some technician output, but blue lasers is also a very good choice and we will need this because we're going to be trying to get disruptors as early as we can. Last, but by absolutely no means least, I'm just going to grab assembly patterns over here for some extra build speed. Strikecraft are fine, powered exoskeletons are okay for that extra worker resource output, but I really do not want to go down the robotic path. In fact, I'm going to be banning robots to make my factions happy as soon as the factions spawn. Going into my pop jobs, I'm going to unemploy the enforcer. We can handle crime under 30, that's not a problem and I'm going to unemploy one clerk to push it up into the Pearl Diver job. So we will produce a lot of consumer goods in a moment when we let the month tick over. I'm also going to split our fleet up into three individual ships and then send those ships off to explore. I'm going to be careful with my Admiral. I know that basically nothing very close to my home system should have hostiles in straight away, but once we get a bit further out, I will take them off this job to make sure they don't accidentally die. We're going to not try and explore with the Admiral, we're going to do something a little different. Don't worry, I will explain how. Of course, I'll also go off and survey this lovely Psi-17 habitable world next to us. Now, another thing we need to do is look out into the galaxy and look for any unexplored systems that we have hyperlane vision on. Here are two. Why are we doing that? Well, they have the Shroud Witches. What we want from the Shroud Witches is we want a teacher. In order to get a teacher, we need 500 energy credits and 50 influence. We start with 100 influence, so that's not a problem, but we don't start with 500 energy credits. To get there, I'm going to sell consumer goods a month, and actually, let's put that up a little bit higher to 20, and we are going to get those additional energy credits really, really quickly. Once our ships are in position and next to an adjacent star, I'm gonna run over to my policies and edicts and quickly turn on crystalline sensors, and then turn it off again before the month ticks over. That's going to cost us one rare crystal to turn it on, but we will get vision on adjacent systems without having to use our Admiral or our science ship. This is very important for early exploration. Now, 
I can find my other guaranteed habitables. And here I can see we have a size 20 ocean world just two jumps away from the capital. I'll be going for that next after the red ore system. We've also had our faction spawn. We should take a quick look at them. Now, one thing that will make them very happy is having someone on your council from every faction. I've been lucky to roll one of every ethic amongst my starting leaders, but if you don't, don't worry too much. We can always hire one leader of the correct faction type and put them on the council instead. In fact, Decima Umbria here might even be a better choice than our Minister of State because they have the politician trait for an extra 5% council agenda speed. I also want to go through each faction and check their issues. Of course, the Xenophobe faction are super happy with us because we've met no aliens and we're completely alone in the galaxy. They are granting 10% additional happiness to all of their pops empire-wide, along with quite a bit of extra unity. And I am going to, at this point already, ban robotic workers. That will boost the approval of my spiritualist faction above 80%, so I'm getting 10% additional happiness across the board. That means all of my pops are now 10% happier than a regular empire. It's really crazy. For our first tradition, we're going to dip into statecraft. That will grant us 50 additional edict funds straight away, and then we're going to be taking constitutional focus and amongst peers as well. I can also turn on Veneration of Saints to get a little more spiritualist outcome. I could turn on the others at this point. I don't need to. All of the factions are quite happy. I don't need extra star bases right now. I've just reached my 500 energy credits, so I'm going to go and order a teacher. The teacher is very, very good. We get now a level 5 leader that we can place straight on the capital. We get extra amenities for that. We get extra unity for that. We get extra, extra unity and apparently some crime reduction as well. We can also now put them on our council. This means that we're going to be getting, because it's a level 5 leader, additional time towards council agenda progress. Quickly rebalancing my economy a little bit, I will start buying some minerals. We need more of those. And I can also buy a few alloys. As soon as we hit 200 food, consumer goods and alloys, we need to straight away get a colony ship up and running. That colony ship is going to go down here on the red ore system just as soon as red ore finishes being surveyed. When it comes to picking which of these you want first, Amongst Peers is possibly better to get first. We're not going to fire this agenda until Amongst Peers has been taken because we want that extra boost to experience level. So getting constitutional focus first kind of doesn't really speed us up very much. For my first building, I'm going to grab a research lab. We'd like to have extra research and we're going to make it happen. Once my fleets reach the furthest distance they can go, I can't go any further without equipping an Admiral. I'm then going to turn on crystal sensors again to get more vision before turning it off. I'll probably do this five or six times. This is going to be my early exploration. I found another ocean world, a size 18. That could be nice, but we don't necessarily want to take it. Infinite opportunities will be fired as soon as we can. That gives us now 10% happiness. As mentioned before, do make sure you have amongst peers when you do that, because this has granted us an additional level on one leader and lots of experience for our others. For our next agenda, you might be tempted to go with Expand the Council. I wouldn't recommend that. Instead, we're going to take Mind Over Matter. This is a very fast agenda. It's only going to take us 37 months. And in fact, we're going to fire it when it's got around 55 to 60% progress. It grants us plus 25% progress on Psionic Theory. Psionic Theory is a science, is a society research option that will cost us 9,600 society research, which is four times our current research option. That research option is going to take us somewhere around six years. If we fire that agenda, we're getting the same number of research points as six early game years for about two years of agenda time. That's definitely worth it. I've got out to my next level. I'm going to quickly pause the game. If you're playing multiplayer, you can't really pause, but just turn on crystalline sensors quickly and turn it off again. Now at this point, we're only at year one. There's a lot happening so far. We're actually not going to take another tradition pick right now. We're going to wait. We're going to save that unity for taking Mind Over Matter and rushing that out just a little bit early. Now the Red Ore system is fully surveyed. We are, of course, going to add it to our empire and send over that colony ship that we built earlier. We can also do another crystalline sensor push to grab just a little bit more. Now that I have enough food, consumer goods and alloys, I will build another colony ship. With both colony ships out of the way, we really don't need extra consumer goods. And that's where stage two comes in. Now I'm going to switch over our living standard to utopian abundance. 
utopian abundance costs quite a few more consumer goods, don't worry we can support that economically, it grants us 20% happiness for all of our pops in the empire, that's amazing, but even better, our unemployed pops will now produce happiness and research points. By making that switch I will have to stop selling all these consumer goods, we're going to suddenly have quite a few less, and I'm also actually at this point going to reduce the number of alloys we are producing. They are just going to now be unemployed pops, the same with the clerks, get rid of those, they're going to be unemployed pops that are simply producing unity and research for us. We don't need so many consumer goods so we'll also unemploy an artisan. I'm going to switch around my trades a little bit, I'm just fiddling here, I'm selling five consumer goods, buying a little less in the way of minerals, that gives me a bit more energy income because I want to clear the sprawling slums. I'm going to clear the sprawling slums and then I'll add another research lab. At the moment I'm getting as much production as a research lab, if not a little bit more, from these four unemployed pops, so that's all good. I've got over a hundred alloys, this actually means I can unemploy all of my metallurgists, which again means I can buy even fewer minerals and set up those blocker clear plus the research lab that I talked about just a little bit earlier. This sprawling slum will add an additional pop, then we'll put out a research lab so we've got more researchers making more research. Ironically, research labs are less consumer goods efficient than just having unemployed pops, but actually we're fine with that. Now that Mind Over Matter only has about 13 months left on it, I'm going to spend 900 unity and fire this bad boy off early. It's best to wait until it's around 55 to 60% of the way through, that really does get the cost down, as long as you are of course under 100 empire size. With Mind Over Matter out of the way, we will expand the council. With Hydroponics Bay out of the way, we're now looking at our next technology. If we had planetary unification, I would take that next. We don't have planetary unification. Pop growth speed is nice, but actually we're going to push into completing psionic theory, so I'm going to start sinking some research points into that. Because we can keep taking the psionic boost though, it's going to take me nowhere near as long as what we're currently looking at here. Our first colony has just completed. Of course, this is going to be set for research, it's the smaller of our two colonies, so I'm basically going to put quite a few research labs here and start making bank. We have an important choice to make right now as well. Either we can turn off immigration. Immigration at the moment is reducing pop growth on our capital to basically nothing. If we turn it off, we will lose a little bit of happiness from the uh, egalitarian faction, but it won't be enough to put it below a threshold. We will still be getting plus 10% happiness. I am for now going to turn on migration controls because I want to keep the pop growth on my capital, not having it run away to our colonies straight away. We have plenty of unity, so I can actually turn capacity subsidies on as soon as we get the option. That gives us a healthy little boost to our energy. We only have two workers, but it's still nice to have. We're up to 150 total research by year seven, which honestly with the new tech rework is somewhat respectable. You could get it higher, don't get me wrong, but we're also balancing other aspects of our economy here as well, namely a large unity production. On our second colony, the bigger colony, I'm starting off with an industrial district and switching it over to a factory world straight away for extra industrial district build speed. We're also starting to dip down a little on consumer goods so I will let another artisan become employed so we're now at full artisan and pearl diver employment. Expanding the council now at year 8 is very cheap, we're over 60% of the way through, I can spend 1000 unity just fire it off straight away. After that we'll go straight back into Mind Over Matter. For our new position I will take Minister of the Seas. Our level 5 leader is going to switch on over into Minister of the Seas and actually I'm going to recruit a new official to take the Minister of State position. It won't be there for that long but that extra 2 stability could be alright. Unfortunately Dark Lord Sexta Carizia is going to have to be dismissed. We've also now definitely got enough unity to grab shared benefits, so I am going to take that as well for plus one effective counselor skill. That basically boosts the output of Master of the Seas by just a little bit more, so we're making 12 consumer goods per pearl diver, which is very, very nice. I'm going to fiddle with my trades a little bit more, sell a little more food, buy a few more minerals, just keep the economy functioning. We're at year 10, that means it is election time. We definitely want one of our two military leaders to end up in there. Unfortunately, Vitiate's faction is not super strong, which means he might get kicked out. Instead, 
we're going to let Minister of Defense Vopiska take over for a little bit by increasing support there. We also don't really need as much unity right now. I'm going to switch over from temples and replace one of those with a research lab on the capital. That's also going to reduce our amenities output. So to offset that, I'm going to spend 400 consumer goods on distributing luxuries. I've also noticed one of our neighboring systems is quite mineral rich, so I will go out and grab that with my construction ship. We don't want to grab too many systems. We are trying to keep our empire size relatively low here. Next up on the list, we're going to take Evolving Society. That'll boost our unity and completely offset the fact we've just lost a couple of priests. We're also now only 12 months away from Sonic Theory, so we'll be getting that done around year 11. Very, very tasty. We've met some aliens. I'm going to improve relations with them because we don't really want them to attack us right now. We're very, very weak in terms of our alloys. With Sonic Theory now complete, I'm going to take pretty much whichever is the cheapest here, which actually is going to be Xenolinguistics. We want to roll planetary unification because we want to get to the next level, tier two, and be able to upgrade our capitals. Otherwise, it's now time to use all of those uh, unity points I've saved up and yeah, we're gonna sign Ascend in basically almost one go. This changes us from being latent psionic to full psionic empire-wide. That's going to provide us with additional bonuses. We're looking at more unity, more happiness, and all of our leaders then become fully psionic. The force is strong with you. A powerful Sith you will become. And if you're enjoying this video, please turn that like button to the dark side. Unfortunately, in this run, we've just run into, into dysfunctional counselor. That's really, really bad. There's nothing I can do about this without fully restarting. I do not, absolutely do not want to lose this level five psychic ruler. So we're going to bite that penalty for now. Hopefully this doesn't happen to you on your run and hopefully we can still pull something good out of the bag. Last up here, I'm going to grab Shrouded Communications. That means we fully completed our Psionic Ascension Path. Excellent. For my first Ascension perk at this point, I have a couple of choices. Tech Ascendancy is actually going to be relatively nice for us. It will give us a little helpful boost early on at this point. One Vision is also useful. Less pop amenities usage and more unity plus governing ethics attraction is fine. Imperial Prerogative is something we definitely need to take in our first two Ascension perks. I'm probably not going to take this one now as it won't give us a direct bonus straight away. Instead, I'm going to go for Tech Ascendancy and then hopefully spec into Imperial Prerogative second. In order to make sure my colony with the research stays happy, for my third building, I'm going to throw down Luxury Residences. That grants us five amenities, which you'll notice when we change over to a research world, don't have to do that yet, but we could, would keep us positive on amenities rather than going negative. And I don't want to go negative. Evolving Society is far enough along now that we can launch that early at a quite cheap cost of only 900. We are still below 100 empire size. I'm then going to take Psionic Supremacy. We want to take this early on. This will grant us a 10 year boost of plus 20% resources from our Psionic Pops, plus 10% unity and 40% research speed for Psionics. That Psionic research speed we don't care about, we do care about plus 20% resources from every Psionic Pop in our empire. We're now at a point where we are ready and I can turn back on, or I should say I can turn off my migration controls. That's going to mean these unemployed pops in the capital are going to go to other places and we'll get a little bit more pop growth on our other worlds, but it won't be too much. There is planetary unification. Part way now onto getting uh, the full level we need. We have one, two, three, four, five. That would be six. So that, from that point onwards, we can possibly unlock the level two government building technology, which we really need. Disruptors as well have rolled. That is amazing. The only other thing we need now really is destroyers. Hopefully we can roll that in the next five to 10 years. With immutable directives finished, I've now finished statecraft and psionic. I will take Imperial Prerogative. That's going to keep our empire size nice and low. And because Immutable Directives gives us a 25% boost to council agenda effect duration, that means I'm going to be able to fire off this Sonic Supremacy and make it last an additional two and a half years, which is really, really good. We're now at year 2218. We have a thousand unity. It's time to make a fundamental switch in our government. We are mostly happy with uh, Empress Xana here. 
we're going to switch over to oligarchic and we're going to swap out our parliamentary system, we don't need that anymore, and replace it with catalytic processing. Before I do that, it is important to unemploy all of your artisans before you do that on your capital, otherwise you're gonna find there's some weird things going on in a moment. Because you'll have full metallurgist employment and we don't necessarily want that on the capital. We'll also be refilling our council. The head of research stays, the minister of defense stays. The minister of state though can go and whistle for their dinner because we're going to be taking minister of the seas and the new principal catalyst role, giving us 2% additional catalytic technician output per level. I've recently hired a new scientist. I'm gonna throw them in the principal catalyst slot and then basically just refill my council. We're now making more alloys and still reasonable consumer goods, but we're not done there. Next up, we're going to change our economic policy to militarized economy. You'll notice I've saved up about 3,000 consumer goods. That means our lovely Colonia Pacifica over here is going to be changing into a Ford world. And let's see what that does to us economically. It's going to be a little bit tough to look at straight away, but hopefully it's all all right. Yeah, we're losing food and we're losing consumer goods. That is to be expected. Next up on the agenda, another agriculture district on the capital to grab additional pearl divers as well as additional anglers for more food production. Because those pearl divers are getting boosted by our council slot, meaning that they really can pretty much ignore the minus 25% from militarized economy. We're starting off comfortably making 50 alloys, but those are rookie numbers. We can definitely get those numbers up. There is colonial centralization at year 19. Perfect, absolutely perfect. Now we can trigger psionic supremacy early and move on to something else. I'm thinking mind over matter again. We're gonna keep running this while we can rather than actually taking the telepathy tech because it's such a quick agenda that it's a no brainer here. We, it's, it's free. We basically, we do this for 30 months and we get bonus levels for everyone in the council. You'll also notice this has really helped our economic situation. We're now basically doing fine for all resources. With Mind Over Matter complete, we can now look at either departmental efficiency or give and take. I'm gonna go with departmental efficiency because actually we don't need the additional faction approval. All of our factions except the Sith Ascendancy block, which are the smallest faction by far, are giving plus 10% happiness. But plus two counselor skill level means that our Minister of the Seas provides a lot more consumer goods and food. With colonial centralization complete, we can upgrade the capital and then finally build a Psycor building. That building is going to grant a whopping 20% boost to resource output on our home world, which is currently most of our resources. Rolling destroyer at year 22 is not terrible. We can still get a nice destroyer fleet up quite early with this. We've maintained the relationship with our neighbor, improving relations constantly. Occasionally, I sent them a few gifts of some basic resources just to make sure they stayed neutral and did not want to come and kill us. Mainly because I very much like being alive. Of course, for tradition number three, we're going to dive into supremacy. That's extra naval capacity, extra naval capacity, extra damage, extra fleet capacity, extra damage. It's the military tradition. When it comes to building the Psycorp building, I actually have two choices. I could either build it straight up and thus lose some mineral income, about 16 minerals per month. I don't really want to do that. Or maybe some energy. Again, I don't want to do that. Or I could replace the priests. Now, we're going to be making a lot of unity. 65 unity from just these two telepaths alone. So that extra boost means, yeah, we can do without the priest roll. These telepaths alone have basically stabilized our consumer goods income by providing a 20% boost to those pearl divers. It's lovely. With over a hundred minor artifacts, I can also proclaim a religious revelation. That's mainly going to give me lots and lots of unity. That's what I want it for. I can then spend that unity to immediately launch departmental efficiency early. And next we'll dive back into mind over matter again. We're at year 2227. I've just rolled the eco simulation tech. This is essential to unlocking the food production bonus building. And we, we do want that building. Normally you wouldn't want food and it seems inimical to me to say this, but eco simulation is really good. 20% extra food from farmers, or should I say anglers who are currently already making 22 food per pot. That's crazy. 
and that is without any extra edicts running. With Mind Over Matter done again, we uh, might as well take give and take. It's uh, it's all right. Uh, then we should level up some more leaders. I'm actually going to swap out the principal catalyst for now because that principal catalyst is on a research world and we kind of want them as an analyst to boost the research production there. We're at about year 29 and I've saved up 10,000 alloys. Our economy is also generally positive across the board. We have a neighbor. That neighbor is kind of wary of us. So I think it's time now to prepare a fleet. And then once we have a big fleet, because they are inferior technologically and economically, and we also make them inferior militarily, we will be able to take them as a tribute, thus further stabilizing our basic resource economy, allowing us to specialize even more into these catalytic technician jobs and more research jobs. For this purpose, I have designed a slew of disruptor destroyers. Now, there's a choice really. I could run with just Corvettes. Now I do have a choice. I could run disruptor Corvettes. They cost around 140 alloys a go. Disrupt Disrupt the destroyers here cost around 259. That's just under double. But for just under double the price, we actually get an extra 200 additional hull points per two naval capacity. Two corvettes give us 400, but one destroyer, which is the equivalent to two corvettes, gives us 600 hull points. That means that our ships will be better equipped to deal with other disruptors. Also, because we are teachers of the shroud, we have another advantage. We fully psionically ascended, so our commanders have shield hardening. For that reason, I'm not actually going to minimize the shielding on my ships. I'll keep that in there because we will be utilizing some of that when our shield hardening is used to deal with enemy missiles or enemy disruptors. I will also be using the move down trick. Basically what this entails, if you haven't heard about it, I'm going to hold down shift and then when there's only a couple of days left for each of these sets of destroyers, I'll move them to the bottom. That means that, well, two things. First, we don't have to pay upkeep on any of these ships until they spawn. And if I decide I don't want the fleet anymore, I can simply delete them and get a full refund. Whereas if I actually build them, I won't get anything back. I'll also switch over my diplomatic stance now to belligerent. That's going to buff my naval capacity just a little bit as well. Once I finally complete Supremacy, I'll probably jump into Supremacy, but, but right now I haven't done that. Looking back as ever at our agendas, we have to keep coming back to the Council because we do want to rush these agendas as much as possible. We're at Year 30 and we've got Level 5 and 7 people, except for this poor fool on the end, in all of our positions. For only 1600 Unity, which is just 10 months, we can save ourselves 26 months on this agenda. We're going to do it. We now have a respectable little 7.5k navy. We're going to go and use it to beat into submission the Prosnak and Sovereign systems. The war goal I'm going to use is, of course, tributary, meaning we'll get cash from them on day one as soon as the war finishes. One thing you should definitely do a little bit earlier than I did, as soon as you get that level 2 capital building technology, begin to breach the Shroud. We need to breach this round in order to find our Covenant. It also can't hurt to build up a few units of Sith army. That means when we find some planets, we can land on them and complete the Achieve War goals a little bit quicker. We won't bother with the capital, but planets like this, which are basically undefended, let me tell you, we just need one army to be able to go and take it. The enemy have turned up. They brought about 5k worth of Corvettes. Luckily, that will stand absolutely no match to our 9,000 fleet power of disruptor equipped destroyers that will live up to their name and destroy the enemy. After our psionic supremacy agenda runs out, we will have some economic issues. They can be fixed by simply selling some of our alloys and buying more of whichever resource it is we need. In this case, I'm going to grab a few more consumer goods every month. I'm also going to lay claim over here to the Brustam system because they've actually stolen our Shroud Enclave. So we want that back. Even though they have the mighty Hrozga, we've not really dared go into their home system because of that, we still won the war anyway. And now we have not just the Shroud Enclave, but a whole bunch of extra resources from our subject. It's not much, but it's a nice boost that's going to get us to that 2250 goal. 
At year 37, I've just rolled cruisers. Hopefully we can get that out of the way relatively quickly and then get some cruiser fleets up around year 40. The next goal is going to be to basically fortify our position. We're over 100 empire size now, so I am going to grab this additional ocean world. And I'm going to push off all of the pop growth on our capital to other places. We want it to go possibly not here to Eurus, but definitely to Colonia Pacifica. We need more catalytic technicians. Rolling a Covenant here, we've just rolled Composer of Strands. This is definitely a good one, and honestly, if you get this, I would just take it. However, if you've rolled the Zroni Precursor, and you've managed to save up some Zro, you might actually want to not form with the Composer, and instead form with Zeech, with the Whisperer. Zeech, I believe, is currently the most powerful of this build. I'll take a look at why a little bit later, when I show you a separate run-through that I did. My fourth tradition, I'm going to do something that might seem a little counterintuitive. I'm going to grab Harmony. And the main reason for this is that Harmony unlocks the inner stability agenda. That means we can hit 100 stability on all of our worlds, massively boosting production, and we'll kind of alternate between psionic supremacy and inner stability so that we can kind of keep a level economy. I will absolutely be looking for mind and body here as well, though, just to boost our leader lifespan a little bit more. We're now at 22.56. This has actually gone a lot better than I was expecting about 15, 20 years ago when we actually didn't have the holographic cast technology. Since then, we've grabbed orbital rings, star fortresses, and nano separators. What does all of that mean? Well, we now have a tier 2 alloy nano plant on this world. Because of catalytic processing, that doesn't just grant plus 2 alloys per pop job, it grants plus 2.5. Yes, there's additional food upkeep, but we've got plenty of food. I'm sure we can stomach it. On top of that, I've thrown down our Sanctum of the Composer for three extra telepath jobs and a 5% boost to resources from jobs on this world, as well as the regular Psycore. That means we're getting 50% resources from Psionic Pops. In orbit, I've placed an orbital ring and upgraded it. That means I can put down the alloy processing facility for another plus 1.5 alloy from jobs. Our leader here has the forged focus for a nice little 10% boost, along with being level 4 for an additional 8% boost. We're now making 22.5 alloys per pop at year 2250. This is crazy. We're making 600 alloys per month right now. We have 25k in the bank. The main issue we're going to have soon is we're going to run out of naval capacity. Luckily, I'll finish Harmony in a moment, and then I'll almost certainly take Galactic Force Projection to boost our naval capacity by an additional 140. That's another fleet. And then our 35k is going to start looking like 60 or 70k. And if we lose ships, well, there's not really going to be a problem. We can build one cruiser per month at our current alloy income. It's it's crazy. We aren't doing amazingly for research here. I actually had to swap some people out into some other jobs. I've moved them across into the alloy jobs just to boost our income. Let me show you another save where I chose a different covenant and that gave us some different bonuses. Here it is also 2255. Our economy is looking slightly less healthy. We've got basically the same number of alloys, but quite a few extra research points. We do have another vassal. This vassal is to our east. We are over here. And yeah, we're definitely the Sith still. Don't worry about it. This wasn't a, a run that we did earlier. Instead, though, I've made a covenant with the Whisperers of the Void. I was lucky enough to get the Zroni and complete it, meaning I had lots of Zro income, allowing me to reroll for my covenant. Why did I pick Whisperers of the Void, though? And why do I think this is possibly the most powerful Covenant now in Stellaris? Well, we get minus 3 stability and minus 7% unity. But, I mean, look at this. That's completely not an issue because with inner stability running and 100% pop approval, we still have 100 stability on our worlds. We also get access to the Sanctum of the Whisperers. Zeech praise everything. And we'll get plus one envoys, some infiltration speed, yada yada, but mainly plus three telepath jobs. The true bonus that Zeech gives us is that we get research income. Yes, we get two researchers worth of research income per telepath. So these five telepaths here are equivalent to ten researchers. That is very, very tasty. And Empire-wide, that has enabled me to boost our research income to about 900 points. 
I will keep putting that up further. Basically, at this point, given our alloy income, given our fleets, it's time to go out and just conquer the rest of the galaxy and make them all our bitch. You know, you should really be glad about this because me working for you, you'd end up as my bitch. I think it's fair to say Psionic Rush has come back in full force. This is no longer an early game rush. This is now a mid-game economic powerhouse that can take on, I'm pretty confident, basically any other build out there. The dark side of Stellaris is a pathway to many abilities some would consider to be unnatural. This video uses some of the best civics in Stellaris. If you'd like to find out more about the civics in Stellaris, which ones are good, which ones are mediocre, and which ones you really should not use, you probably want to check out my most recent tier list. If you'd like to see that, click the video on screen now.